You just heard the first half of a piece by Gustavo Aguilar called Wendell's History for Steve. You'll hear the second half at the very end of my remarks in which I play a recording of the improv improvisation with that tape and recite a poem by Wendell Berry um, that will come at the end. Um, I remember when I was studying with Ayun when she was my graduate student at the University of California in San Diego, <clears throat> the thing I learned from, well, actually, it's not true, I haven't learned it yet, but I would like to learn how to have th uh, this elegant and light presence and get absolutely everything done and have everything run like clockwork. So I know, Ayun, you've been thanked repeatedly, but let's take a moment. Thank you so much. I'd also like to thank McGill University for its generosity in housing this conference and to the wonderful assistance that Ayun has put together as a team uh, for having made us feel all so welcome. And of course, thanks to you all who have traveled to be here, whether you're a presenter or a performer, a composer, or best of all, a simple musical adventurer. Thank you very much. I'm directing the following comments not to my fellow organizers and not to the established professionals here, but rather to the younger percussionists who are a part of this gathering. Um, I envy you. Envy is not normally a very positive emotional state, but what other word could I use to describe the vicarious thrill I feel when I imagine you encountering for the first time the thrill of musical creation, the exploration of new arenas of artistic uh, content, and to the youngest among you, the stewardship of our art well beyond the midpoint of the 21st century. It's not difficult to imagine that some of you who are in this room will be still around, still playing music in 2075. Please say hello to the future for those of us who won't make it that far. In the coming years, you will hear a piece of music that blows away the cobwebs for you. You will play a first performance that rewrites all of the rules. You will notice a sound so small and unimportant to the bigger world that it, practically speaking, doesn't exist. And then you will take that sound and make, if even for a moment, a cradle from it. Like I said, I envy you. But some of you may not feel like you're in an enviable situation right now. You may be, in fact, apprehensive about your professional prospects, insecure about your mastery of your chosen art, uneasy, anxious. This is normal. I can sum up your fears in a word, failure. The very real possibility that you could fail is what you're nervous about, or at least that's what I was nervous about when I was in your situation. But what if right now, I were to guarantee your success. What if I promise you right now that you will not fail, that you cannot fail? Would that take away some of your uneasiness? I think I can actually do that, because in 35 years of university teaching and more than 50 years of professional playing, I can say that everyone I have ever known who has had a high level of talent and motivation combined with good work habits and dogged perseverance has succeeded. Such a person will succeed, guaranteed. I cannot think of a single student or colleague or friend I have ever known with those three attributes, talent, work ethic, and perseverance, who is now not in some way succeeding at his or her chosen profession. Let's take a closer look at these three qualities. The first is easy, intelligence. You all have that in abundance. Look, you're, you're smarter than I am, or you wouldn't have been admitted to UCSD or McGill or basically any first-rate university. I was a solid B student and absolutely no more than that. But I did have the, the second two attributes, work ethic and perseverance. And these are completely within your control. Without them, you will not succeed, but with them, you will. Absolutely guaranteed. There is some fine print, actually quite a lot of it. Obviously, you can't spend every spare moment playing fantasy football and then complain to me that you couldn't learn bone alphabet. You've got to work. You can't, can't quit at the first obstacle. You will be knocked down. Just get up again and again and again and again. So with your newly minted guarantee of success, the primary question facing you changes in a very interesting way. The question is no longer, will you succeed? 
but rather what kind of person will you be when you do succeed? What kind of music will you make? I know there are other questions that are on your mind now. Will you make money? Yes. Will you own a car? Yes, if you have to. Will you have a place to live? Yes. Will you be a success? Yes. These are easy questions, but the new questions. Will you leave the earth a better place than you found it? Will you understand the breadth and complexity of the musical world and your place in it? Will you age gracefully and with purpose? Will you care enough about the world you have made to share it with someone younger as a teacher or a mentor or a coach? Will you be compassionate towards those who have less? These latter questions are much more interesting and more provocative ones. So the bad news is this. Simply playing well by itself is not enough, not nearly enough. You will need to be a whole person and not just a successful performer if you are to live with grace and purpose. The goal then is not success, but wholeness. The poet Stanley Kunitz, when he was poet laureate of the United States, was asked in a seminar about a detail in one of his poems. He said, oh, you misunderstand. <laughs> I don't work on the poems. I work on the poet. This wholeness, the view of life as a totality and not just a set of tasks, is the key to organicity. There is more than one way to get there. The Persian poet Rumi said there are a thousand ways to bend and kiss the ground. Here are a few that seem to work. Curiosity, which is really just another way of saying nonconformity. Curiosity poses the question, what would happen if I did it differently? And here I have to tell you an uncomfortable truth. Aging musicians are, by and large, quite pleased with themselves. To the extent that they have succeeded, they feel that theirs has been a worthy path, maybe even the worthiest of paths. They, and let me drop the pretense here and say we, <laughs> think we are right about most things. We don't do this purposefully, but because we so often think we are right, we will try to shape you in our images. Oh, it will be subtle, but we will be happy if you emulate us and flatter us and by following in our footsteps. We're human after all. The older generation of artists, along with scientists and academics, has done some good things. We've invented Velcro and sunblock and popularized the five octave marimba. <clears throat> but your job is not to famous, make us feel comfortable and loved. If by emulating us, you accept our premises without questioning them, you will have unplugged your sense of curiosity and with it, the essential spark plug for creativity. Awareness. As a musician, this becomes personal. I believe in the power of sound, to communicate, to ennoble, to heal. The most important things in the world are conveyed by sound. If you propose marriage to the person of your dreams, you whisper, you do not pass a note. If you want to ease a squalling baby, you sing a lullaby, you don't send a calming message by semaphore. Sound is so important, in fact, that we cannot effectively block it out. Nature, therefore, has not provided us with ear lids. But I see people all the time trying to block it out. Admittedly, we do live in a loud world, but we live in a world also that is full of beautiful and precious sounds. The wind in the trees, an autumn rain on a roof, the surf. And yet when I see people jogging on the beach in San Diego, they have earbuds all the time. What are they listening to instead of the birds and the surf? Bach, Slipknot, talk radio? Finally, I believe that an indispensable component of becoming a whole person, an artist in the best sense, is the constant ability to surprise yourself. Think about the people you most admire. I wager that none of them woke up at the, uh, one morning at the age of seven and declared, I will become the senior vice chancellor of a major research university, or I will invent an unbreakable woodblock. No, we discover who we will become and surprise ourselves along the way. In fact, the ability to surprise oneself is the direct result of my first two recommendations. If you are pulled forward through an aware life by the tug of curiosity, you will inevitably surprise yourself. Now to sustainability, the key word in this keynote address. I think a lot about sustainability, and for many years I believed that forward momentum, thus sustainability, lay in pushing forward our historical midpoint, the midpoint is that spot within the repertoire of a person or institution in which there is as much music behind it as there is in front of it. 
given how much music of the 1950s and 60s I play, the historical midpoint for me personally is about 2002 and the premiere of John Luther Adams' The Mathematics of Resonant Bodies. For the average professional symphony orchestra, their midpoint is roughly the Symphonie Fantastique, or even earlier. Viewed this way, our job was to advance the fulcrum and move the boundary between past and future forward, neither abandoning the need to go forward nor forgetting our history. Now, however, I find myself between personal philosophies, so to speak, and I'm less sure at this moment that the guardianship of the past is really our job as percussionists. A quest for sustainability can be driven by some very good motives, but there are also, there are also some, some venal ones, including, among others, nostalgia. From the Greek nostos for home and algos for pain, nostalgia is a desire to go backward. I confess to feeling nostalgic sometimes, meaning that I often return to the formative works for solo percussion and by doing so embrace that aesthetic, those principles, that time. This may not be entirely without merit. After all, there was great music made in those early days, repertoire pieces like Zyklus and Safa, but also less well-known, nevertheless amazing music by composers like Kenneth Gaburo and William Hibbert. When I see my friends from those days, people like Russell Hartenberger, Stuart Smith sitting here among us, and I talk to them about the music of Ben Johnston or Steve Reich, I remember so keenly the thrill of creating new music from new ideas. Perhaps we were wrong, but it felt then, and to me it still feels like we were all enjoying a sunny afternoon somewhere on a hillside, only to realize that the hill was a volcano, and like it or not, new land was being created beneath us. To help me understand my evolving notions of sustainability, I have adopted three rhetorical stances. The revolutionary, the scientist, and the percussionist. Here below are thumbnail sketches of those stances. For a revolutionary, sustainability is, deep, is a deeply suspect, practically counter-revolutionary concern, ultimately an old man's issue. We quote the Cajun axiom with pride, percussion music is revolution. But an aging revolutionary is often a sad person, a firebrand who worries about his pension, major medical insurance, and 401k has lost a little of the spark. I'm not sure I was ever much of a firebrand, having worked my entire professional life within the supportive confines of academia. <clears throat> but I can relate to the interplay between the thrill of creation and an increasing desire to cultivate a legacy. I mused recently in an article about the similarities between percussionists of the early 21st century and the believers of the early Christian church in terms of our historical position, patterns of language, and the social dynamics of our interactions with one another. To reprise a rather messy encounter between two revolutionaries, Peter and Paul, at Antioch, Peter of the older generation and Paul of the younger disagreed about the establishment of new doctrine. In the end, the problem was personal. Peter knew Jesus and thought of himself as a living representative, not just of Jesus' ideas, but of the man himself. Paul's vision, however, was based on a conversion after the fact. His faith was ignited not by personal loyalty to Jesus, whom he never knew, but by the fire of a new and pure ideology. <coughs> Pardon me. As we percussionists reprise this split image, there is a strong temptation for those of us in advanced middle age or to be more honest, early old age, to say to young percussionists about the composers we knew, just as Peter said to his younger followers, you didn't know him, I did. Here is what he said to me. Conversely, there is a temptation among younger percussionists to observe that the purity of our or origins has been compromised and that what is needed is a thorough house cleaning. This leads us percussionists, just as it did in the early church, to a complex and not always tranquil rapport between a younger generation of adherents with its legitimate search for an original experience and an older generation zealously protective of the past. In both the first and the 21st centuries, the pursuit of grace and the defense of the canon pull in opposite directions. But as I reevaluate my stance about sustainability, I realize I have not asked myself an essential question. Where are we in our life cycle as percussionists? Are we at the very beginning of our lives? For example, fifth graders rhapsodizing about the good old days of the third grade as we think back to the 1960s. 
Or, more depressingly, are we on life support but still making delusional plans for the next year's vacation? Certainly no biologist would be willing to make observations about the life cycle of an organism she is seeing for the first time. She must wait for the organism to die before know how, knowing how long it's supposed to live. That doesn't seem very helpful, so perhaps it is not the biological but rather the physical sciences to which we need to turn for a model. As we so often do, we can find wisdom in that first and still greatest percussion work of the modern age, ionization. We just heard the piece together the other night, so I can make this part short. Varez set up a process in ionization in which highly charged oppositional relationships within his material, that charge coming from how the material was characterized by noise content, rhythmic structure, and cultural heritage, evolved or ionized over the course of the piece. Volatility at the outset produced forward momentum, but the consequence was the production of a stable, electrically neutral byproduct. This byproduct in ionization is the handsome and magisterial music of the piano tam-tam and chimes at the end. Grand, but it lacks the sizzle of the opening. The same process is happening to us as an art form. We have leveraged the electrically charged clashes between sound, idea, history, and culture that dominated the early part of the 20th century in order to produce our early great repertoire. But as an inevitable byproduct, that electrical charge has diminished, and the musical products have become increasingly stable. This is not a bad thing by itself, but it does contain two major dangers. The first is that we might actually like the stable better than the electric. Look at the world of percussion in 2015 with its highly paid star performers, its corporate endorsements, and its cushy academic positions. The danger is that we might say, great, this is a lot more comfortable than our scruffy beginnings. We percussionists are recent arrivals in the leafy neighborhood of classical music, and sometimes nothing makes us happier than to be liked by our new neighbors. Let's remember that we are bumpkins, and we should be proud of that. Belonging feels good, of course, and some stability is desirable, but we would do very well as an art not to get too comfortable. The other, more serious problem is that we will long for the original conditions of volatility and seek to recreate them. This masquerades as the well-meaning project of historical authenticity, but inevitably it creates, instead of a reprise, a museum. The basic failure of, in quotation marks, historically informed performance, and quotation marks, is that, it is not so, that it's not so different from a Civil War reenactment. Lots of running around by guys who think that the past is great, but who still drive a Harley to work on Monday. So please, let us not fall in love with our version of gut violin strings and a tuning note at 415 hertz. Ah, if only there were more scientists in the early mu music movement. A scientist might observe that organisms must die, that decay is necessary, and that from the death of one creature comes the food and sustenance for another. A scientist might note that, etern that eternity is not possible since stable systems produce no energy. A scientist would know that the collapse of a life system occurs when the weight of having lived exceeds the energy of wanting to live. Our lesson in this regard comes from the late works of Feldman, which do not seem to end, but rather to shudder to a halt under the accumulated weight of their pasts. And finally, back to the realm of religion. The central deity in Hinduism is not Brahma, the creator, but Shiva, the destroyer. Nothing new can arise if we keep the, the past on life support. Yes, this means even musical gems of the very recent past. Pardon me. Being an instrumentalist in the traditional sense means internalizing uh, oh, I said, uh, now a percussionist looks at the dilemma of sustainability and has yet another point of view. It is here where I feel I have found my greatest traction. Being an instrumentalist in the traditional sense means, it means internalizing a language of organization. But as an experimental percussionist, the ability to externalize a system of organization is paramount. A system that internalizes is easy to understand. You hear performers say this all the time. I want to be one with my instrument. That essentially means reimagining a foreign object, the instrument you're playing, as an extension of your body. The cello is no longer a wooden box, it is a torso. The tuba is not a hunk of metal, but a kind of lung. This model does not always work in the percussion family. 
While objects like the marimba, vibraphone, and timpani are instruments in the traditional sense, many other objects a percussionist uses, a brake drum, a thunder sheet, or a tin can, are not. Is it actually possible to anthropomorphize a foam-mounted railroad spike? And what psychic dangers await a percussionist who seeks to become one with a tuned saw blade? For performers of non-traditional percussion instruments, a more useful system is external. An external system of organization reverses the paradigm. Instead of viewing a foreign object as an extension of the body, the externalist sees the body as an extension of the object. In short, when I play a percussion piece with non-instrumental sounding junk, I become the junk. The junk does not become me. External orientation has far broader implications than simply percussion performance practice. It means that the boundaries of the percussive art are steadily expanding and increasingly porous. Being an externalist means redefining the word percussion as someone who looks beyond the traditional notion of striking sounding objects. Shortly after Max Niehaus dis delivered the American premieres of some very important early works, including Tsiklus, he said that he would no longer be a percussionist, rather a sound artist. In my view, he never stopped being a percussionist, since percussion to an externalist's point of view, uh, to an externalist, is a point of view rather than a specific set of activities. Without this point of view, we risk shrinking to the least vital versions of ourselves. If, when Vanessa Tomlinson uses a pendulum to create fascinating rhythms and colors as she did in Spill, and as a result she calls herself a sculptor instead of a percussionist, then we have lost something. If, when Roland Ozé makes a daring stage presentation involving spinning tuned boxes, and then he identifies himself as a theater director and dancer and not a percussionist, then we have lost something. If, when Ayun Huang performs an emotionally wrenching version of Corporel and says now she's an actor and not a percussionist, we have lost something. And friends, we cannot afford to lose that much. We cannot afford to define percussion according to the small set of precepts that we have inherited, that tight set of rules that governs most percussion education. Students already feel like they have to learn to play the drum set like Steve Gadd, the snare drum like Buster Bailey, Balinese gamelan like Gung Anom, the xylophone like Bob Becker, and the tabla, well, also like Bob Becker. Uh, <laughs> no one can do all of this except maybe Bob. <laughs> And without a serious reconsideration of this paradigm, we will demand of our young percussionists everything but to learn how to play like themselves. To me, the salient characteristics of percussion lie not in the search for liberty, uh, uh, rather, um, let me repeat that. To me, the salient characteristic of percussion lies in the search for liberty, not constraint. Imagine if whatever per a percussionist did, whatever he or she was led to do, wherever in the world was by definition percussion, we would have transformed our art from an instrumental discipline like the piano or clarinet into an intellectual and emotional launching pad for parts unknown. Where might it take us? The first truly external person I knew was Leo Stadelman, my high school Latin teacher. For four years I studied with Latin, Latin with Mr. Stadelman, and beekeeping, and bicycling, and figure skating. These latter were not hobbies for him per se, but logical extensions of his lifelong goal of revitalizing an old language with new energy. These were not four different projects, but four phases of the same project. It was astonishing to see. When Mr. Stottleman died a few years ago, I noted in the funeral booklet an epigraph from the Book of Psalms. Quid retribuam domino pro omnibus que retribuit mihi. What shall I give back to the Lord for all the good he has done for me? Let's just think about that for a second in this context. What shall we give back to our art for all of the good it has given us? Certainly not just a long line of excellent performances of music of the past. History is still important, and discipline is essential. But let's eat our history, as the poet Wendell Berry suggests, and from the fuel it gives us create a new and richer future. Let's hope that in 50 years, when a young percussionist enters a conservatory program, she finds herself performing Xenakis as a conduit to work in urban architecture, learning John Luther Adams as an entree to meaningful work in reforestation. They used to say that if you wanted to learn how to think, go to law school. 
I say, if you want to learn how to be a complete human being, study percussion. Thank you. Thank you. The crops are made, the leaves are down. Three frosts have lain upon the broad stone step beneath the door. As I walk away, the houses are shut, quiet under their drifting smokes. The women stoop at the hearths. Beyond the farthest tracks of any domestic beast, my way leads me into a place for which I have no names. I go by paths that bespeak memory and intelligence I did not know. Noonday held sounds of moving air, moving water, enormous stillness of old trees. Though I was weary and alone, song was near me then, gay and lightly stepping like a deer. Learning the landmarks and the ways of that land so that I could go home if I wanted to, I lost the backward way and my mind grew fresh. I stood at last, long hunter and child, where this valley opened, a word I seemed to know, though I had not heard it. Behind me, along the crooks and slants of my approach, a low song sang itself, as patient as the light. On the valley floor, the woods grew rich, great poplars, sycamores, beeches, sweet gums, lindens, oaks. They stood apart and open, the winter light at rest among them. And yes, as I came down, I heard a little stream pouring into the river. Since then, I've arrived here many times. I've come on horse and foot, by boat and by machine, by earth, water, air, and fire. I came with axe and rifle. I came with a sharp eye and the price of land. I came in bondage, and I came in freedom not worth the name. From the high outlook of that first day, I have come down 200 years across the worked and wasted slopes by eroding tracks of the joyless horsepower of greed. Through my history's despot and ruin, I have come to its conclusion, and here I have made the beginning of a farm intended to be my art of being here. By it, I would instruct my wants that they should belong to each other and to this place. Until my song comes here to learn its words, my art is but the hope of song. All the lives this place has had, I have. I eat my history day by day. Bird, butterfly, flower pass through the seasons of my flesh. I dine and thrive on offal and old stone and am combined within the story of the ground. By this earth's life, I have its greed and innocence its violence, its peace. Now let me feed my life, my song upon the life that is here, that is, the lives that are gone. This blood has turned to dust and liquefied again in stem and vein 10,000 times. Let what is in the flesh, O muse, be brought to mind. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bravo, Tayun.
Thank you.